this is the next part of how to interpret the Second Amendment if you're a judge, a law clerk, or a lawyer and get it right under the Bruin methodology and not be trapped into going down the wrong path by anti-gun rhetoric. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and New York Times best-selling author. If you have not subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms in America. All right, folks, so we've done a couple of videos here discussing how you walk through. I've been walking you through step by step, baby step by baby step, how you apply the Second Amendment in light of the post-Bruin world, the post-Bruin methodology. There are traps here being laid, in my opinion, by the anti-gun lawyers and the anti-gun movement, and I want to make sure that those traps are identified and we stop them so that we don't get a lot of terrible legal precedents by mistake that's going to require the Supreme Court to unwind years from now when it gets back up to them. Okay, so here's the story. We've already talked about that the first step is you look at the plain text of the Second Amendment when you interpret whether or not, when you interpret the Second Amendment to determine whether or not a modern-day gun control law is constitutional. But when you interpret the plain text of the Second Amendment, you do not do that in a vacuum. You do that in conjunction with the definitions and the interpretations and the analysis that the United States set Supreme Court has already set forth, interpreting the text of the of the Second Amendment so a, a lower court judge or an inferior judge, uh, inferior court may not reinterpret the Second Amendment inconsistent with the interpretations and analysis of the Supreme Court already. So when you see plain text, it's actually the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by Supreme Court precedent in Heller, McDonough, Caetano, and of course Bruin. That's step one. And then once that happens and you can show that any kind of a law in modern America, any law, good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter how long it's been around. So once we have the plain text of the Second Amendment as interpreted by the Supreme Court as long as as well as anything that's necessarily implicated by that, then we just ask ourselves, does a modern-day gun control law touch fingers with that implicated? Uh, is it infringed upon it, uh, affected in any way? If the answer is yes, then the burden goes immediately to the government to demonstrate that whatever that modern-day gun law is, that it is part of the long-standing tradition of regulating firearms in America. And there are some long-standing traditions of regulating firearms in America, which I'll get to in just one second, a classic example. You will all agree with it when I get to it. So that's what the court does. And now we've already talked about in a prior video, in multiple prior videos, at the relevant time period to look for what are known historical analog laws is 1791, the time period of the American founding in the 18th century, not the late 19th century after the Civil War, which a lot of the anti-gunners want to use because they claim that the 14th Amendment applies to the state, you know, causes the Second Amendment to apply to the states, and therefore we should be looking at the time of the 14th Amendment, which is 16, uh, which is 1868. Uh, that's when we should be looking at that, but we've talked about why that cannot be the case in, in, in other videos and I won't belabor the point right here right now so bottom line is once the gun control law implicates the Second Amendment's plain text as interpreted by the second is interpreted by the Supreme Court then the government bears the burn to show there's historical analogs in the founding era that restrict the scope of the Second Amendment to uh, to justify a modern-day gun control law to show that the modern-day gun control law has a historical analog in some way in the, in the founding era. And if the answer is yes, there is a historical analog, then the modern day gun control law is upheld as constitutional under the Second Amendment. Uh, and to the extent there is no historical analog for that gun control law in the late 18th century today, uh, you know, then that modern day gun control law, I should say, would be struck down because there's no 18th century historical analog to justify the 21st century gun control law. And we'll give you some examples of how to think about this in just one second. And before we talk about specific examples of historical analogs, I want to give you this important quote from Nyserpa versus Bruin, where they're quoting Brett. I've talked about how Justice Brett Kavanaugh, when he was a judge in the Heller 2 case in the DC Court of Appeals, when he was a lower court judge, he wrote, explained that late 19th century historical analogs and precedent can only serve to confirm 1791 understandings of the Second Amendment. The late 19th century gun control laws could never undercut the original meaning of the Second Amendment. Here is what Nyserpa versus Bruin wrote to make this crystal clear. Post-ratification, talking about the 14th Amendment, by the way, post-ratification adoption or acceptance of laws that are inconsistent with the original meaning of the constitutional text obviously cannot overcome or alter that text, close quote. The Supreme Court again says that post-ratification, which means post-14th Amendment ratification in 1868, post-ratification, adoption, 
or acceptance of laws in the late 19th century that are, and here's the quote, that are inconsistent with the original meaning of the constitutional text, obviously, obviously, their language, not mine, obviously cannot overcome or alter that text. So to the extent anybody tries to get you to uh, buy into this late 19th century historical analog stuff, don't buy into it. Bruin says you cannot do that. I just quoted the language from Bruin itself. To do so would violate the Supreme Court's instruction in Nicerpa versus Bruin. Inferior courts, lower courts, other judges cannot do that. That would violate the Bruin precedent. And uh, obviously you have to follow the Supreme Court precedents because they're the Supreme Court and all of the judges are inferior courts under Article 3 of the United States Constitution. Okay, so once we've determined the founding period, when is the correct time is the founding period? We've established that. How do we then determine what is a historical analog that we can consider? So first of all, a historical analog is basically something that's similar. So, you know, they're looking for, okay, so we have a laws today in the 21st century involving guns. Was there a similar, sufficiently similar law in the 18th century that we could say the modern day gun control law is part of the longstanding tradition of American American regulation of firearms? If the answer is yes, then the law from the 21st century is upheld as constitutional under the Second Amendment. If the answer is no, there is no historical analog in 1791 or the 18th century, then guess what? Um, the gun law in uh, 21st century America has to fall by the wayside as unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. And the burden to show the historical analog is not on you uh, or me. It's on the government to demonstrate. They have the burden to proof. If they cannot show historical analog and the gun rights movement literally just sits on its hands and does nothing, well, guess what? Uh, we win, the government loses. So the burden and all the work has to be done by the government to show there's historical analogs uh, justifying these modern-day gun control laws. And I can assure you there's not that many out there other than common sense ones that we'll get to in just one second. So once we've established that the historical analog has to come from the founding era period, 1791, a historical analog from the late 19th century doesn't count except to confirm an original understanding from 1791, what else does a historical analog have to be uh, to show or what characteristics does it have to have in order for it to be a historical analog that can uphold a possible uh, night, a, a 21st century gun control law. Well, the next thing is, of course, the, an the historical analog has to be analogous. Now, while Bruin said that the government does not have to find an identical, an identical twin uh, to a modern-day gun control law, it does explain that the how and the why of the 18th century gun control law has to be the same as the how and the why of the 21st century. Now, it's a little complicated, but let's just walk through it quickly. How was the law enforced, or how was the law implemented, and the why was it implemented? Both have to be met for the government to satisfy its burden that a historical analog from the 18th century justifies uh, upholding a modern-day gun control law. The how and the why. Let me explain the how and the why. So, for example, a ban on storing gunpowder in the home. There were restrictions on the amount of gunpowder one could store in their homes in the founding era in Boston. Why was this? Now, one could argue that a restriction on black powder storage and limiting the quantity of black powder storage that you could have in the home in Boston is analogous to a modern day ban on so-called large capacity magazines, which as you know are just standard capacity magazines that have more than 10 rounds. Because the anti-gunners would say, well see in Boston, there are restrictions on black powder um, in homes, therefore we today in the 21st century can restrict the number of rounds in a magazine because there's a historical analog to restricting the number of rounds in a firearm because of this black powder restriction in the founding era of Boston. But this is not true because the how and the why would not be satisfied. The why being is why, why, why did Boston have restrictions on the amount of black powder that could be kept in the home in the 18th century? Well, the why was because the entire city of Boston was made out of wood and these restrictions on the private possession of black powder in the homes in Boston had nothing to do with gun control or self-defense or the Second Amendment or anything touching on firearms, had everything to do instead with fire precautions, fire codes. These were fire regulations to try to make sure that the city of Boston did not burn down because a single person's house caught on fire with black powder in it, and that would cause a conflagration, would literally burn down all of Boston, which at the time was made of wood. Um, so again, the why the black powder restrictions existed in Boston in the 18th century had nothing to do with gun control laws or restrictions on magazine capacity 
or anything like that. It was all about fire regulations. This is exactly actually what the Heller court said. So the Supreme Court has already pointed out that, for example, that would be an example of a historical analog, an arguable historical analog that would not be sufficient because the why of the rule involving fire protection and fire precautions has nothing to do with gun control. And therefore, uh, the anti-gunners in the 21st century cannot use fire code regulations from 18th century Boston to uphold a monetary gun control because the whys are different. The why of magazine capacity limitations today is to prevent criminals from doing bad things. That's the argument. And the why of black powder regulations was to prevent fire. The whys don't line up because the whys don't line up. The historical analog does not work for the anti-gun movement and the anti-gun movement could not use that. So that's an example of an analog that would not work in favor of the gun control movement. Now let's take another example of a potential historical analog. So the anti-gun movement right now is trying to come forth with 18th century historical analogs to justify modern day gun control laws and they're pointing to so-called seasonal hunting restrictions. They're basically saying, look, there's restrictions on when you could hunt in the founding era. That gives us, they basically are arguing that there's not only restrictions on seasonal hunting, like when you could hunt, but also on where you could hunt, meaning you could hunt you know, all across America, but you couldn't hunt like in downtown Boston, for example. So the anti-gunners say, see, that proves our point because there were restrictions on where you could hunt in the 18th century. When you could hunt and where you could hunt, we in the 21st century as the anti-gun movement, we can pass laws restricting where you can carry a gun for self-defense. Concealed because we're going to use these 18th century hunting laws as historical analogs to allow us to control where and how and when you can carry guns for self-defense purposes. But again, that's not going to fly because the how and the why test. Again, the Supreme Court in Bruin says the hunting restrictions on seasonal hunting had nothing to do, the why of the seasonal restrictions. Why were there seasonal restrictions on hunting in the founding era? Why? The why? We know the why. The why was a combination of conservation efforts. You didn't want to kill the entire deer population or the entire population of particular animals. So the why of the seasonal restrictions on hunting in the 18th century has nothing to do with the why of restrictions on carrying guns um, for self-defense in modern day America. Because the modern why by the anti-gun movement is we don't want you to be able to carry a gun because we think there's a public safety concern with people carrying guns or somehow stopping criminals from doing bad things with guns. That's the why in the 21st century, why we have so-called sensitive places and gun-free zones and why we want to prevent Mark and others from carrying guns in, in, in modern day America. That's the why in the 21st century. But the why of the hunting, the seasonal hunting rules was conservation. It was protecting animals wildlife. It had nothing to do with preventing people from carrying guns peaceably for self-defense. You see how the whys don't line up? Because the whys, meaning the why these things exist, do not line up. The anti-gunners cannot use, for example, seasonal hunting regulations from the colonial period, even though those laws are from the right time period, meaning they're from the 1791 time period. Even though the time period is correct, the whys of the historical analogs are not right. Therefore, the anti-gun movement cannot use those because the whys don't line up. That's another example. Now let's take a similar example involving hunting. They're also arguing that there were restrictions as to the where, not just the when, but the where, the where you could hunt in colonial America in 1791. And they say the rules and laws restricting where you could hunt, the where you could hunt also allows them to prevent you from where you can carry a gun for self-defense in modern day America. So again, this doesn't work either because the restrictions on the where you could hunt were basically involving making sure that people think about this in some ways, the where you could hunt argument works in our favor. Think about this for just a second. Okay. They realized that you had a right to discharge firearms in 1791. Obviously, that's the purpose of guns. You can discharge them and fire bullets for self-defense or other lawful purposes. So obviously you could. So where there was concerns about people discharging firearms in a particular area, like in a downtown city area, and they didn't want people hunting in downtown Boston because it was too congested. Notice what happened here. The city of Boston, I, I'm not sure Boston had these, but you get the point. There, there, there are some of these out there in various cities, and you get the point, the, these areas. They were concerned that people would shoot at animals for the purposes of hunting in colonial America, right? But what did they not do? Our founding fathers did not ban guns in those areas, right? They did not say you can't have arms in Boston. You did not have, you cannot have arms in New York. They didn't say that. No, what they said was, 
You cannot use your arms and discharge those arms for the purposes of hunting animals in those confines. So in some ways, if you think about it, when the anti-gunners try to say that there was a concern that there was historical analog gun control laws preventing people from shooting guns for the purposes of hunting in various areas in America at the founding era. Therefore, we, the anti-gun movement in court, can uphold modern day restrictions on where you can carry guns for the purposes of self-defense. But again, you see how it doesn't line up. The founding fathers were aware of the risk of hunting in congested areas, and they didn't want people shooting guns in congested areas to try to kill animals for the purposes of hunting. So, But they did not ban the guns. They did not say you couldn't bring your gun into town. They did not say you could not bring your gun into the city. They did not say you could not carry your gun peaceably for self-defense. They didn't say that at all. All they said is you can't discharge your gun for the purposes of hunting in these particular areas because you know it's too congested. So again... You could, in modern-day America, use those historical analogs to uphold modern-day seasonal hunting requirements, right? You could, if you're trying to like strike down a modern seasonal hunting restriction, saying you could only hunt deer between you know October and December, whatever it is. Well, yeah, there would be historical analogs to do that, but there's no historical analogs on hunting that would prevent us from carrying guns peaceably for self-defense. Likewise, these restrictions on sensitive places, the anti-gunners are trying to say that these where you could hunt where you could not hunt. Those are restrictions on sensitive places. That's not true because, again, those laws in the founding era of America did not, I repeat, did not prevent you from carrying your guns. They just said you can't discharge your guns in those areas for the purposes of hunting animals. You see the difference? So in some ways, the historical analogs involving hunting restrictions that the, found, that, that the anti-gunners are trying to use during the founding era actually backfire on them because remember the, the Supreme Court in Bruin said to the extent there was a social problem that we have today that also existed in the founding era to the extent that the, um, that the American founders did not use so-called gun control law to address that social problem, the anti-gun movement and the uh, cannot do it today because doing so would violate the second amendment so again so so think about that i know it's a little complicated but again it's something you got to think deeply about to get this right and also let's talk about an example of another historical analog law that i do think gets upheld with a lot of common sense but we want to think about this not as commonsensically you know you're a great lawyer if you can take things that are inextricably linked together and you can separate them in your brain and analyze them independently that's when you know you're a great analytical lawyer that was something ken Starr always told me and i always kept that in mind so as we do some of these things i'm taking things that are kind of inextricably linked with one another and we're trying to separate them out and analyze them independently because the the better you understand this the better we can defend the second amendment right to keep and bear arms okay so with that said we all understand going back to the beginning of time to cain versus abel that murder is criminal murder outside of the context of self-defense murder is immoral it's a malum in se crime it's no go laws against murder have been with us for centuries for thousands of years and certainly from the beginning of time in american life to now and we know that murder laws um, are constitutional that mur murder laws are perfectly fine uh, laws that ban murder now but let's break this down intellectually step by step how we would analyze whether or not a murder law that says that you cannot murder people with guns so let's break down how a modern day 21st century law that bans murder would be analyzed as a matter of second amendment law now again it sounds absurd to be able to have to do this because we know that murder laws are perfectly constitutional there's no issues with them but nevertheless i still want to break it down intellectually so you understand the thought process because doing so will help you understand how to think about historical analogs going forward outside of the context of murder which is an easy obvious case so let's break this down so we know we have the right to keep and bear arms as interpreted by the, sec as interpreted by the Supreme Court and any necessary, necessary implications. Now, we know that if you pass the law like in the state of Iowa today that says that, and I'm sure this law is already on the books, you cannot use a firearm to intentionally murder someone in cold blood without self-defense. Okay? You can't murder anybody with a gun. Let's say they pass that law in Iowa right now. Is that constitutional under the Second Amendment? Now, again, I'm not arguing good or bad policy here. I'm talking about is it constitutional and how do we know? How would we think about this to reach the conclusion? Now, obviously, it's constitutional. But how do we reach that conclusion? You can't just say it. you got to think it. you gotta be, you got to be smart, intellectual. Break it down. How do we break it down? It's very simple. Second Amendment says the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's true. The Supreme Court has interpreted all these different words. They've interpreted to bear. They've interpreted uh, to keep. They've interpreted arms. They've interpreted the people, right? 
So we have all this, all this case law that interprets the plain text of the Second Amendment that judges must follow. We know that anything that's necessarily implicated from that, like the right to a trigger, the right to ammunition, obviously from Supreme Court precedent, that's also within the plain text of the Second Amendment. Basic black letter Supreme Court law, we all know this. Okay, now, we now have our hypothetical law in Iowa that says you, can't, you cannot use a firearm and discharge a firearm to commit murder outside of the context of self-defense. Someone brings a Second Amendment challenge saying that this law that bans murder with a gun is unconstitutional under the Second Amendment, okay? How would this work intellectually? We know, we know it's constitutional, but how do we actually get to that conclusion intellectually and seriously? The way you do it is the same approach you do with anything else. You start with the text of the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, yes, technically speaking, if I use a firearm to kill someone, that is part of using a firearm, right? It's the right to keep and bear arms in that context, right? So at, at its first glance, a restriction limiting the ability to fire a gun to commit a murder at first glance touches fingers with the text of the Second Amendment because it, 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 it's a restriction on a use of the right to keep and bear arms. It's, it's, it's a restriction, right? Okay, so now we know that the Second Amendment at, its, at that level is now implicated because it touches fingers with it. But now we have to figure out whether or not that law that bans murder with a firearm is constitutional. So what do we do? So the burden now shifts to the government, the state of Iowa, for example, to then say, is there a historical analog? Is there a historical analog at the founding period that would allow us to say that a murder law that bans murder with the use of a firearm, did that exist in 1791? So now we go to 1791. The court would say, are there laws against murder, meaning are there laws against murder, the use of a firearm for the purpose of committing murder? Well, sure enough, if you look at the 13 colonies, every one of those 13 colonies restricted you from being able to use a gun to commit a murder, obviously. There were murder statutes on all in all 13 colonies at the time of our founding, in all the original states at the time of our founding. So the, Supreme, so the court would say, well, yeah, it, it is a restriction on the right to use a gun to prevent you from committing murder. That is a restriction. That's true. But we then take the next step, which is we look to see if there's a historical analog outlaw on the use of firearms for the commission of murder. And sure enough, we go back to 1791, and there are historical analogs that ban the use of firearms from committing murder, for committing murder. So there you go. So that would be an example of how you analyze and conclude that you have no right, so to speak, no right to commit murder with a firearm because in 1791, when the Second Amendment was adopted, the public understanding of the Second Amendment was under no, no one thought the Second Amendment was about protecting murderers from committing murder with firearms within the scope of that right. And how do we know this though? Right? We know this because every single state that adopted the Second Amendment also had laws that banned the use of firearms for commission of murder. So again, a murder statute in our hypothetical Iowa would be upheld as constitutional under the Second Amendment. But the way we get there, if you see what I'm saying, yes, using a gun to commit murder touches fingers initially with the text of the, the plain text of the Second Amendment, but, but we then use historical analogs to go back in time to 1791. And because every single state ubiquitously had laws against murder, then the Supreme Court or any court would say, obviously a ban on murder statute doesn't fall within the scope of the Second Amendment, and therefore that's in his, those are historical analogs that allow us to uphold modern day laws against murder now. Does that make sense? So that's a little bit of an extreme example, but it helps you understand the process of figuring out when historical analogs can uphold a restriction on the use, uh, in this case, using firearms for, for murder, when you can use historical analogs to uphold a modern day gun control law or a modern day restriction using guns. It is certainly doable. That would be a very easy way to do it. People don't think about it because it's so obvious, but still I want you to break it down intellectually and think it through because I think that's helpful for really being able to analyze historical analogs of when they're useful and when they're not. Okay, folks, so I know this is a very sort of difficult discussion about historical analogs and how to understand them. I'm sure you guys will come up with a lot of great questions for me in the comments, and I'll try to address them. But this is very important to understand that the government has the burden of proof to come forth with a historical analog, and the only way a historical analog can justify a modern-day gun control law is if they can show a how and the why analog in the uh, 
in the founding era. And I think if you think about our examples we just went through, okay, hope you learned a little bit something. I know we're getting into some really geeky videos, but this is extremely important to get this right. And some of you out there have to get this right because if you make some mistakes, it will cost all of us in the gun rights movement and we don't want that. So again, uh, hope you learned something. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.